So, hi, my name is Rafael Pass, and I will talk about uh, this work with uh, Hubert and Elaine on uh, consensus through uh, this notion of herding. I will get to what that is towards the end of the talk. But first, let me start by summarizing what consensus is. So, this is in fact a very old task that has been studied since basically 78. Uh, we have a set of nodes. Here we have, um, I don't know, uh, six, five of them. And uh, these nodes would like to agree on an ever-growing list of transactions. Okay? So this is today what we call a permission blockchain, but as I said, this has been around for a long time, uh, with names such as state machine replication, BFT, and so on and so forth. What do we mean for these nodes to agree on these transactions? Well, typically we require two properties. The first one is consistency, and consistency, roughly speaking, says that if I take any two nodes, then the review of these transactions that they have should be the same. And the second property is liveness, which roughly speaking says that whenever a node wants to add a transaction, that it should get incorporated in everybody's view sufficiently fast. So a little bit more formally, consistency actually consists of two parts. The first one says that at any given point in time, if we take two nodes, me and you, Either my ledger, my view of the transactions that have been confirmed so far, is a, is a prefix of yours, or vice versa. And a second property, which is sometimes called future self-consistency, says that my ledger should always be a prefix of my future self. Is this very loud? Can you like lower it a little bit? Liveness is actually parameterized. Liveness is parameterized by a function t, and this function determines how fast uh, a transaction is guaranteed to be introduced into a ledger. So whenever an honest guy would like to add a transaction, if we satisfy t liveness, that means that everybody should have this transaction inside their ledger within t of n, comma, uh, k steps, where n is the number of players and k is the, some security parameter. So there's a fixed bound on how long it takes for a transaction to get incorporated. And both these properties of course, don't need to hold with probability one, but one minus negligible probability. This notion of liveness is, in fact, very strong. This is often called synchronous liveness. So to achieve something like this, we need to consider a synchronous model of communication. So in a synchronous mo model of communication, we, in essence, allow people to communicate in rounds. Think of a round as a time step. And we have the guarantee that whenever a good guy sends a message, it gets to everybody within some maximum uh, delay, and this delay is called delta. Okay, so there is a maximum upper bound on the time it takes for a message to get delivered to everybody. In fact, often, for simplicity, uh, we can just assume that even if a bad guy sends a message, there's also this maximum delay of delta until it gets delivered to everybody. So whenever somebody sends a message, Either good or bad, it gets delivered to everybody within delta time steps. And this assumption is often without list of generality. Typically, that's the case in a classic uh, st uh, setting. It's also the case for what I'm considering here. So for now, I'm just going to assume that. Additionally, whenever you send a message, uh, the message is authenticated. So we know whenever somebody sends a message, who it comes from. All right. So this is, as I said, a very uh, old model going back to the uh, late 70s. And basically, a lot of things are known for this thing, almost everything you want to know. So the earliest uh, results said that if you'd like to achieve consensus, you need to assume that uh, uh, two-thirds of the nodes are honest, and the rest can be completely malicious. So I'm going to consider uh, a setting where some nodes are completely uh, maliciously controlled and others are honest. And so as long as uh, one third are honest, we can achieve it, and this is optimal. However, if we additionally have access to a public key infrastructure, then we can do a lot better, and then we can actually get uh, security even if uh, we just have a single honest guy. So we can handle any number of corruptions. Yet those protocols take, require a lot of rounds. However, uh, if we additionally assume that 50% are honest, we can also get uh, something that gives you uh, liveness within a, a constant number of time steps. So uh, what I mean by constant here is actually takes a constant times delta uh, time steps uh, in order to, for a con transaction to be confirmed. Okay, so there's still a little gap uh, whether we can do better than n over two here, but uh, except for that, pretty much everything is known. 
Let me go over the general principle for getting consensus protocols. In fact, most of them follow the following simple uh, uh, recipe. So we're going to have a protocol that proceeds in epochs. In each epoch, we select some leader. How this leader is selected is not important. Think of it as just being round, round robin. So first the first guy goes, then the second guy goes, and so on and so forth. And this leader gets to uh, propose any set of any batch of new transactions. And the way he proposes them is by just sending it out to everybody else. And then these guys are going to run something called a Byzantine agreement protocol to agree on this batch of transactions. Okay. Uh, and once they've agreed on this set of transactions, we now say that that set of transactions has now been added to this uh, ledger and has now been confirmed. So I have to tell you what Byzantine agreement is. Most of you probably know it, but let me just very quickly uh, repeat it. So in a Byzantine agreement protocol, it's very similar to a consensus protocol, except it's just a single shot uh, game. So we have this set of nodes. Each of them have some input. And they talk to each other, eventually generate some output. And we require three properties. Take any two honest guys. They should agree uh, on what the output is. So they should always get the same output. Termination just says it should terminate within some fixed polynomial time in delta. And the interesting property here is that of validity. Validity says that if all of the honest guys start off with the same input, then they should also get that as an output. Okay? So in particular, if we go back to this uh, original uh, recipe, uh, this liveness condition that we wanted, that whenever somebody wants to add a new transaction, they send it to the, uh, the leader. The leader, if he's honest, he's going to actually send it to everybody. And then by the uh, validity requirement of the Byzantine Green Protocol, we know that everybody now starts off with the same input, uh, the batch of transactions, and they will therefore agree to it. So therefore, that transaction will be added, and we're done. And consistency of this uh, recipe follows directly from the consistency of the, uh, or the agreement property of the Byzantine Green Protocol. So very nice, we just need to construct Byzantine Green protocols, uh, and that can also be done, uh, and uh, so that's it. Now, the topic of this talk, of course, in the era of Bitcoin, is to handle uh, consensus in, uh, in a logical setting. So a setting where the number of nodes is huge. The typical setting where these original protocols were considered had three or five or six uh, nodes. It was, they were not meant to handle uh, a scenario where you have a huge number of nodes, whereas the Bitcoin protocol uh, and the blockchain that underlies it indeed handles this huge number of players. So that's awesome. Um, uh, so by, by handling a large number of players, mean, I mean that we have a protocol that scales polylogarithmically in the number of uh, players. Okay. So it turns out that Nakamoto's blockchain protocol actually does. And that's great, but unfortunately it does rely on this uh, proof of work, so it's very expensive and wastes a lot of computational effort. Um, in particular, I think at the moment, it's more than uh, the total solar production in the US. It's quite a lot. Okay, so a little bit more formally, by communication efficient consensus, we would like to have a consensus protocol satisfying two properties. The first one is that the total number of bits that players multicast in total among them should be polylogarithmic in the number of players and the total length of the, uh, the transactions and the security parameter. Okay? So basically, polylog in the number of players uh, uh, and uh, then multiplied by the, the total uh, length of the transactions. Additionally, we also require, for this not to be trivial, we also require that whenever somebody would like to add a transaction, we have liveness, the transaction should get confirmed within some uh, polylogarithmic uh, time also. Okay? So basically everything, both the uh, communication complexity and liveness should be polylogarithmic in number of players. And now you see this and you think, well, you know, this should be kind of easy to do. There is a trivial folklore approach. Right? If we have a protocol that handles a large number of players, why don't we just subselect a small group and then write it among those guys? Very easy, right? And uh, we have various different methods of subselecting a, a, a committee of players to, uh, to run this. And indeed, it does work. 
But that approach of subselection, in fact, only gives you a protocol with static security. In particular, if we get to adaptively corrupt nodes, then this can be completely broken because I can just, if I know exactly who gets elected, uh, I can just corrupt only those guys and I'm corrupting a small fraction of players and I control everything. So that's not so great. In fact, even if I have a communication efficient Byzantine agreement protocol that is adaptively secure, this method still doesn't work. And uh, in fact, there has been some recent work, including by ourselves, uh, that show how to achieve business and agreement protocols that are con communication efficient and adaptive secure. But plugging those things into this paradigm still won't work. And the issue is regarding the leader. Because we remember, in this recipe, we need to first have a leader who sends things out, and then they, we use business and agreement. If this leader is corrupted, the validity condition we had from the underlying uh, Business and agreement protocol gives us nothing. Because if the leader is corrupted, he can send garbage to the players, and we're not guaranteed to make any progress. OK. Uh, so uh, the question then that I would like to address is whether we can get a communication efficient consensus protocol that is also adaptively secure. And that's the topic of this uh, talk. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, Nakamoto's original protocol indeed satisfies this guarantee, and this was shown the, a few years ago. Uh, but it requires proof of work. Okay? However, it shows that assuming 50% of the players are honest, uh, in this proof of work model and using a random oracle, we can get a protocol that that's, uh, is communication efficient and handles adaptive security. Uh, the same year, it was also shown by Chen and Michali that you can also achieve it without proof of work. And they indeed obtain in the public key uh, model and using a random oracle. They show a communication efficient uh, protocol that is secure despite adaptive attackers under uh, assuming one third of the players are at most corrupted. But this time they use erasures. So they assume that you can erase uh, computation and erase uh, your memory completely. Let me explain how either proof of work or erasures help us overcome the issue. Roughly speaking, the issue with subselection is that it should be hard to predict who is the leader in advance. Right? The first thing I... Okay. Uh, if I can predict who is the leader in advance, they're just going to corrupt him, and then I can create havoc, right? Because I uh, let him send uh, garbage transactions. With proof of work, Nobody can predict in advance. If we're doing this mining, I can never know who's going to be elected leader, so that seems to be good. Right? Another approach, uh, and that's the approach used by Chen and Michele, is to use a VRF, and you heard about that in the previous talk. So use this verifiable random function, which allows me to figure out whenever I'm going to become the leader, but nobody else can figure out before it has happened. So we allow that this kind of secret subselection, where the person who gets elected on the committee figure it out, but nobody else finds out un unless, uh, until they reveal the proof that they have been elected. So that's great. That deals with the fact that you cannot figure out who is the leader in advance, both of these approaches. Now here comes the interesting thing. It shouldn't just be hard to predict who is the leader a priori, but it should actually be hard to predict who is the leader even after he has become the leader, a posteriori. So what do I mean by this? After the leader speaks, I know who the leader is, right? And then I can just take him and corrupt him. Now, he's only sent something out, so I can't deal with that. But I can just send out some other message. And given that there is some delay on this network, I can just slow down the first one and make the second message come faster. And therefore, I get these two conflicting transactions again. So that seems to be an issue that's harder to deal with. And indeed, the way they are dealt with with proof of work is that actually just because you managed to mine something once, that will not help you to mine again. You're the elected leader, but uh, even if I take you afterwards, that doesn't mean you're going to be more likely to be elected leader again, to send an invalid thing. And the way Chani Mikali deal with this issue is that you're elected leader, you send out this transaction for everybody, but as soon as you send it out, you erase the relevant state needed for the VRF. So, 
you send it out, I come and corrupt you, and then you're like, well, I'm not a leader anymore. I could not have been leader before, and I don't have the key anymore. Okay? So this is how Erasure deals with it. Now, one issue with this approach, which has been raised uh, by several people, is that it doesn't really seem rational for me to erase this thing, because by erasing it, uh, I'm kind of losing a possibility that I can use later on. So, uh, our main result uh, is indeed showing that you can overcome uh, this issue and not uh, deal with erasures at all. So, we present a protocol in the PKI and CRS models. We don't even need a random oracle. Uh, uh, assuming standard crypto assumptions over bilinear maps, in particular, we need a non-interactive uh, zero-knowledge with adaptive security that handles uh, the same uh, uh, one-third uh, corruption uh, without erasures, without proof of work, and without random oracles. All right, so uh, in, uh, in the rest of the talk, let me convey on a high level what our approach is. So as I mentioned, <coughs> the idea is going to be relying on this notion called herding. And the way we're going to do this is, in fact, as a first step, we're going to define a new type of uh, single-shot consensus primitive that's going to be different than just business agreement. It's something we're going to call batch agreement. And it's going to have slightly stronger, stronger properties. And then we're going to show to implement this new type of batch agreement from herding. What's batch agreement? So batch agreement is a little bit more complicated than, uh, than just a business agreement. So here we consider an execution where the players, uh, before starting a protocol, get to interact with, inter with an environment. So an environment is providing them transactions. So I'm getting some transactions. You're getting some transactions, blah, 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 blah. And at some point, the environment says, start. So it tells everybody, let's start the protocol. At that point, they have seen a list of transactions. OK, we call this time t0. Then they run the protocol, and then they generate some output. The security properties, the first two, agreement determination, are just as before. Agreement says that we have the same output. But validity, on the other hand, is stronger. Validity says that any transaction that anybody has seen up to time t0, when the guy said start, minus some delay, needs to be included. So it sort of says, whatever I have seen up until time t0 minus 10 seconds, I need to include it in my output, and so should everybody else. So this notion, you can see if you have this thing, you can very easily get consensus, because you just sequentially repeat this uh, one, after, one after another. Uh, and that guarantees that whenever somebody wants to add a transaction, it will get added uh, sufficiently fast. Okay. So the question is, how do we achieve this thing? All right. To do that, we're going to rely on this idea of herding. What is herding? Herding uh, is uh, actually something that uh, came up in the uh, economics literature and probably even earlier in the, uh, in the, um, in the literature on the social. Uh, Social science, okay? I don't know what area it's called there. Uh, so uh, this is what it's about. So let's say we would like to uh, decide whether smoking causes cancer or not. We start off having some initial beliefs about whether it does or not. So we call this W is a state of the world, which is a bit, either zero or one. Does smoking cause cancer? We start with these initial beliefs. Uh, and then we're going to speak one after another. So first I go. And I'm going to output a guess for whether I think smoking causes cancer or not. I guess yes. Okay? And then you go, and then you make a guess. But the point is, you have already heard my guess. So right now, you have your beliefs, but you're going to update your beliefs based on my beliefs, based on my guess. Right? Now, if we assume that everybody's original beliefs are as strong, all right, so we have seen as much evidence, uh, we've just seen the signals about whether uh, this is, the bit is 0 or 1. So if the beliefs are as strong, in that case, and we assume that players are rational, and not only they're rational, but they assume that everybody's rational and so on and so forth, it's called common knowledge rationality, then what we should do at any given point is, I should just output, make a majority decision. If I have seen the first guy says no, the second guy says no, even if I originally believed that it's yes, I'm like, well, you know, that guy was rational, so he must have uh, had a bet that it's a uh, no, zero, and then the next guy must have told so also, so therefore, I should change my mind and output uh, no also. So what happens at this point? 
Well, even if I think it's a yes, if the first two guys say no, I'm going to also say no. And then the third, fourth guy will going to say no, and so on and so forth, and we get what's called an information cascade, so everybody uh, says no. So this is uh, very nice, uh, or not. It's, it's sometimes called the foolishness of crowds, because it leads to uh, sometimes crazy uh, decision, even though everybody starts off with having like, uh, good beliefs, you just have a few silly individuals that start off saying bad things, and it just uh, propagates, and this is one way to explain the spread of fake news, and so on and so forth. Right? But note, on the other hand, that they all agree. Right? They don't agree on the truth, but they always agree, and this kind of happens with probability almost one. So we're going to use a very similar approach to get a consensus and to get patch agreement. We're going to Given a set of uh, transactions, a batch of transactions, we're going to give it a score. So each individual is going to assign a score to whatever, to some batch of transactions. And the way it's going to uh, assign its score is going to be by first looking at this batch of transactions and giving it some initial score. Think of this initial score as my initial belief I had. Okay? And then I'm going to add to that the number of votes I've seen for that batch. So people are going to be voting. People are going to say, which, is, which one do you think is the best? And that's going to be a vote for it. So my score now for this transaction is going to be how much I believed it was uh, worth at first, plus how many votes I've seen for it. And then, basically, we're going to do the same type of uh, uh, herding type of protocol. So people are going to go one after another, and they're going to send a vote for the transaction that they think is the best, the batch of transactions that they think have the highest score according to them. So when it's my turn to go, I just vote, say, I'll put a vote for my best transaction according to this score. Okay? Now, it remains to see how, in what order people are going to go. Uh, the way we decide the order is, again, using a VRF. But there's a little trick here. I'm not just applying the VRF to, uh, to the RAM number like it was done before, but I'm also going to apply the VRF to the set of transactions and the RAM number. Okay? And we just do this for Paul Logarithmic many times. Right? So very easy. I start off with my, uh, an original set of uh, transactions that I've heard from the environment. I'm going to score that. Uh, then uh, when it's my turn to go, I send a vote for that. Then it's your turn to go. Then you're going to vote for your best uh, batch of transactions, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we update our uh, scores, uh, therefore beliefs, based on how many votes I've seen. Um, this VRF needs to be adaptive secure, and uh, we've shown in an earlier paper you can do that based on uh, GOS, um, GOTOS, Ostrovsky, Sahai, and that's where we need these bilinear maps. All right, I haven't told you how to set the initial score, and that's actually going to be uh, the important part of it. The way we're going to set the initial score is by first, given a batch of transactions TX, I'm going to determine how old this batch is. I will say that the transaction has a certain age, <clears throat> and it's going to have the age of the oldest missed transaction in TX. So let's say we have some bad uh, guy who's going to propose some batch of transactions that to me uh, uh, look old because it has missed some transaction that I have seen, uh, that I have seen in, in my view, but he has excluded. In that case, I'm going to refer to this one as being old. It has been a long time. Uh, it's not fresh anymore because it's missing something that should have been there. Okay? I will now set my initial score, my original belief of this uh, transaction thing, uh, basically as some exponential decaying function uh, of the age of the, uh, of the transaction. So it's going to be some, some constant times 1 minus epsilon times the age of the transaction. And in fact, the right way to look at this is due to age in time divided by delta, where delta is the network propagation time. So really, you want to, sometimes exponential, they're decreasing in the age uh, in terms of uh, network propagation. So why do I have this bizarre scoring function? The idea is the following, and this is the key for, for the proof. If I take two honest guys, their initial scores are actually going to differ by very, very little. Because the difference in, uh, in age between, uh, because, the, the, because of this network propagation assumption, any two honest batches of transactions uh, are, are going to have very small gaps. Additionally, we have that if I take some 
some honest guy, uh, his batch, he's going to score it high. His uh, original batch has age zero. It's very young, so therefore it's going to have a score of at least C. So it's going to have a high score. Now, what happens now is, uh, I'm not going to really go over uh, the proof, but uh, the idea here is that if the initial score differ uh, by very little, that means that scores that good guys have will differ by very little, and that means that good guys, in essence, are going to concentrate their voting effort on uh, the same uh, transactions. And you can prove, and this is a little bit tricky to do, but it follows using proofs similar to the way uh, blockchain protocols were analyzed, that there will eventually be some set of transactions that get a lot of uh, votes. Now, since uh, by this observation too, each good guy scores his transaction high, good guys will never vote for any transactions that are very, very old, because their score is just going to be too low. And consequently, uh, from that, we have uh, validity. And uh, the agreement property will basically follow from the, the idea that if, uh, uh, that as we argued before, some transaction is going to get a lot of votes. But, and here is the point, uh, the key point to why we're tying this, uh, the eligibility property of when you can vote to uh, the transaction. Uh, you can argue that the number of total votes that can be sent is going to be uh, small, and uh, from that uh, we can improve agreement, and here we rely on two-thirds honesty. Obviously, I'm not going over any details, but so to summarize, we've shown here is that in the public key model with a common reference string, assuming standard uh, crypto assumptions, we can get a communication-efficient consensus protocol <coughs> that handles uh, uh, attackers corrupting up to one-third uh, of the players. We, don't, we need no erasures, no proof of work, no random oracles. And what I think is probably the most cool thing here is that we're using this uh, idea from uh, in the social sciences and economics, this idea of herding, that is typically viewed as a kind of a bad thing uh, and use it for, for something good. Uh, to, to leave you some open questions, the very natural thing is, can we do better than one third? We believe we can do. We think one should be able to get it up to one half. Uh, and another nice thing is to deal with partial synchrony. Um, and two things worth mentioning is, in fact, uh, in this other work, we have shown that a PKI is needed, so you cannot remove it. And uh, stronger corruption models are actually not possible. Thank you. Questions for Rafael? Uh, so, thanks for a nice talk. Um, I have a question. So, is this protocol or this technique that you use related to Avalanche also somehow? Because it looks very similar, similar to this kind of voting and infection, and then they all turn. I saw some Medium articles at some point. Yeah, uh, a priori, I don't think it, it is, but you know, I don't know. All right. Yep. Okay, the very last question of the. So, uh, oh. I think he wants I, I'll delve into two questions then. So, why is it logarithmic? Oh, wait, wait, hang on. Hang on. Wait, uh, There's uh, another <laughs> question. Can we take him? Okay, you can say after. <laughs> no. yeah. I just had a short question about the erasure uh, sort of thing. Do you think one could use, say, one, say, use like some cryptographic parameters like one time signatures? Like, can we incentivize, I guess, uh, people to erase? To erase, right? Like, say that, you know, if we have one time signatures, then yeah, you can. Spent, you, you better delete your key because otherwise, uh, if it's used twice, uh, you lose, I don't know, everything or a deposit or something. Uh, well, so I guess what we show here is that you don't even have to think about it. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, in fact, the way these. Uh, the way these things work is that you. You have this VRF key that needs to be used in order to compute the future still. So that's why it's a little bit complicated, because you want to allow the good guy to be able to, to, to reuse the key many times in the future. So actually, technically, what you need here is some kind of forward secure uh, VRF, where you can evaluate on index 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 until i, but you cannot evaluate it. Well, you you want to remove, erase the possibility of evaluating on the past and still while being able to do it in the future. So that's why it's a little bit tricky. And even if, I, uh, even if I try to erase, you know, with active corruption, we know it's not so easy to actually erase things uh, in practice. Uh, 
So, so was that after the fact del uh, deletion again? So that's a. Uh, 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 in our model of adaptive corruption, which is also the same model as uh, all notions of adaptive corruption in, the, in this uh, vein of work, whenever I corrupt you, if you have sent a message, I cannot delete it. So we're still in a synchronous model in the sense that you have sent something out, I can delay it by delta steps, but I cannot delete it um, right after corrupting you. So one could potentially consider a stronger model where I corrupt you, uh, and then if this has not been delivered yet, then I can remove it because you're bad at this point. Uh, and in that model, it turns out you cannot get communication efficient. Uh, and that's an upcoming policy paper showing that. All right, now we come to the very last question by this gentleman okay. here. <laughs> so you, so you're just, saying just, just one. Uh, okay. We so you're saying, that, uh, you you can ask, you're saying that it's logarithmic in the number of parties, but it doesn't look logarithmic because, you, I mean, you, you, every party has to sign this transaction, so why, why is it logarithmic? No, 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 no. Uh, it's not every party signing the transaction. I am proposing uh, uh, the transaction. Yeah, I'm making the screen. Yeah. So, why, where so is the I'm only picking people to vote on these things. I'm only picking and polylogarithmic many people. I didn't tell you what the parameters are, but yeah. And also this, this uh, scoring function should be more generic. I mean, uh, it should be a generic solution. It's not like, uh, because it's really particular, but it looks like it could be. You just need some properties of the function. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the only properties you want are these two things. This is just some function to satisfy that. We want something that behaves this way, that we have something where the initial scores will not differ a lot. But if I have some old transaction, it should really bring, down the, uh, uh, bring it down by a lot. So I guess these two things and additionally property that old transactions should be scored low. All right, let's thank uh, Rafael and the rest of the speakers.